Welcome, Professor Ryan. Thank you. Good morning for me and good afternoon for you, I understand. <laughs> thank you, thank you.
गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन गुड मॉर्निंग इंटरनेट कनेक्शन सो आई टू रीच इट माई वाई फाई मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग गुड गुड मॉर्निंग एंड good afternoon and good morning yeah good morning we go we following ans time so let's let's do good morning to everyone everyone <laughs> we'll start in next three or four minutes i'm just waiting for surya to join surya yeah 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 ma'am i'm here okay. already uh, okay. can we can we start in say another five minutes i guess the students are joining on youtube also they are joining some of them uh, no i'm worries. here also. yeah whatever you say yes uh, our vice principal uh, mr smarajit padhi sir has also joined sir welcome Hello, sir sir with your permission can uh, we wait for another yes uh, yes i am i got so sorry so sorry maybe i was speaking with, with the mute here what happened now only when i, I was down and i came in and uh, then suddenly my my this uh, this one has gone on uh, you know like uh, it is updating i don't know what <laughs> <laughs> so immediately i had to do it on my mobile so it took some time so sorry for that okay so i think uh, i am i am audible yes sir so you are audible, perfectly no? fine yes perfectly yeah. fine sir yeah. yes 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 yes, yeah. yes. so we will start in say another 5 minutes there were some sir yeah sure sure okay
Uh, Surya, can we start? Yeah, let's start. Uh, I think. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sir, Padi, sir, with your permission, can we start? <clears throat> yes, of course, ma'am. Of course. All right. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Um, good morning, everyone, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, we have gathered here to attend and listen to a webinar on a very important topic of gender inclusive science communication opportunities and challenges. As we all know, uh, KC College and HSNC University um, has been taking very con. by Dr. A.P. Jairaman, sir. Um, and uh, this webinar uh, is a very important step towards our efforts of um, working towards strengthening of science communication as a field. Uh, KC College also has been, uh, and HSNC University also has been um, a very strong supporter uh, and a very <laughs> strong advocate of gender inclusive educational spaces. Uh, so this important discussion that we are going to have uh, we are going to witness today uh, is definitely going to add a lot to our efforts as as institution. You all on behalf of HSNC University uh, at this webinar, uh, we have with us uh, Mr. Smarajit Padhi. Uh, he's the vice principal of KC College. Uh, he's also the head of the Department of Commerce. He's the co-chairperson of the Board of Studies of Commerce and Management, HSNC University, Mumbai. Associated with KC College for over two decades now, Sir has been a vice principal of, of KC College for the past 14 years. Sir also has played a very important role in various activities uh, of HSNC University. With his great experience, he has always played a very significant role in helping KC College and HSNC University reach to a position where we are today. Sir, uh, I now hand over the podium to you for delivering the welcome address of the event. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Surya, ma'am. Uh, first of all, uh, very good morning to all of you. And uh, uh, myself, Swajit Padi, and on behalf of Dr. Hemlata Bagla, Honorable Vice Chancellor of HSN University, I extend a very, very warm welcome to all the participants today. Uh, particularly, I would like to mention uh, Dr. Jaraman here today, and uh, we are actually proud to uh, have him uh, as, as, as have him as, as a kind of associate for this one because I know he is working on science communication, but I don't know for how long and so very well. And his astute kind of observations and everything I have said for his lectures and all those. And I know like how he feels about this science communication. And it is something which is so very much needed. And he has stepped in at the right time. And the most crucial thing that he has done about it. And for that, sir, uh, a special welcome to you. And uh, I, again, I extend our greetings from HSN University to you as a co-host. And uh, I am also uh, very proud to say that uh, we are associating with uh, uh, the women's um, Indian Chamber of Commerce uh, and Industry, um, Dr. Parul Shet, Dr. Parul Shet here. Um, no, no, Dr. Dweta Patil here, and uh, who is going to be um, kind of moderating this one. And uh, I extend a warm welcome to uh, Dr. Parul Seth, and who is an author and a journalist and uh, deals with communication all the time. So we will be having a uh, kind of say, right kind of say, inputs from her, like how it is done. That means she is also communicating and she is in the business of communication and uh, she knows how to communicate and we'll be learning a lot from her also. And uh, we are also uh, welcome, Dr. Anne uh, uh, Dextra, if I am not uh, kind of wrong in pronunciating, uh, pronunciating uh, the, phonet the phonetics of uh, pronunciating the name, pronunciation of the name, etc. 
Um, so I'm not going to take much time here because so stalwarts are here, we'll be speaking and we'll be learning from them. I just uh, uh, here tell one thing, like when I saw the theme about the gender inclusive uh, communication we talk about. So this is something which is a must as, as I know, like, and when I talk about the theme and I I talk about like the opportunities and challenges. So opportunities may be there, but in my mind only challenges do come because when we are talking about a particular kind of say, a, we are not talking about a change. When we talk about it, it is some, some, some kind of a Uh, we are, we are, that means a condition, we are not conditioned in certain ways since childhood while uh, we can and uh, at this juncture. Uh, I think, sir, you uh, have, I think, uh, accidentally muted your mic. Okay. Please unmute. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes, you're audible now, sir. Yeah. Hello. Yes, yes, you, are you are not audible to me. You are saying something I could see. I told you not because I have a good It went for this one. I'm doing it from my mobile. You, you even hear me? No, you can nod. Yes, 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 sir. Yes, sir. Okay, fine, fine. Now I can hear you. Okay. Aishna, I can hear you. So here I don't see any kind of an opportunity. Rather, we can say challenges over here because we are conditioned to perceive things, condition to say things in a particular way. And we will be, uh, we, we, it is bound for us, like it is very much pertinent on us that we should be now framing, thinking like that, framing the phrases and everything in certain way and speaking like that only. And today when I look at kind of said, uh, unrest going on around India, we can see how the kind of say uh, debates that go on on the TV channels and how the fallout is there out on the street, we can see. So I, I say that uh, we cannot undermine the challenges that people are speaking, under stress you are speaking, under certain conditions you are speaking. So unless and until we condition ourselves to say or communicate in a particular way, we may be lending into trouble, we may be hurting somebody else, which is not at all a very desirable outcome of any communication. And uh, I think uh, we are going to learn that in this initiation that we are going to have today. And I once again welcome every one of uh, you on behalf of HSS University, Honorable Vice Chancellor Dr. Bagla, to this uh, to this, this kind of say, really learning uh, event that we are going to have. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, sir. Have a nice. Thank you so much, uh, Padi sir, for your welcome address. Uh, as Sir said, the webinar today is organized in association with National Center for Science Communicators and Women's Indian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Uh, today's panel discussion, today's webinar is uh, going to be moderated uh, by Professor Daivata Patil. Uh, I would briefly introduce Daivata Ma'am to all of you and then without wasting much time, I will hand over the session to Daivata Ma'am. Uh, to take it forward from there. Uh, Daivata Ma'am is an academician researcher uh, in the field of media and communication. She has been working in the field of media um, for last around one and a half, two decades, if I'm not wrong. Uh, Ma'am is uh, Maharashtra State President uh, of Information and Broadcasting Council uh, of Women's Indian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. She's very actively um, uh, involved in a lot of uh, mass media related, film studies related activities uh, in and outside Mumbai. Uh, we are very fortunate to have you Daivata Ma'am along with us as the panel moderator for the day. I welcome you once again at the session and I would now like to hand over the session to you uh, for uh, our further discussion. Over to you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Surya. Thank you, HSNC University for, for this wonderful collaboration. Thank you all the distinguished panelists for joining me here. Uh, I'll just briefly you know, talk about the outline of the program and then we'll move on. So uh, I will introduce one by one and then I request each of you to share your first thoughts about the theme and then we move on to the question answer session. Is that fine? Okay. So uh, since we have two female participants and one male uh, participant sharing their views on gender issues. So we'll start with uh, Jai Raman, sir. Uh, let me just briefly introduce him. He is uh, a nuclear scientist, chairperson, National Center for Science Communicators, 
scientific committee, mem committee member, PCST Network. He's also president for STEAM Academy and also principal scientific advisor with HSNC University. I'm very glad that such a distinguished personality and a senior nuclear scientist is with us sharing his views on gender science communication. And uh, when I asked him to share his introduction, he said chairperson. That itself shows how gender inclusive he wants to sound. So sir, please share your first thoughts, first initial reflection on this theme. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Devika, did you raise any question or you are going to the... I will ask the question. I want you to share your first thoughts about the theme. So our theme for today is gender inclusive science communication, opportunities and challenges. What comes to your mind first? Okay. What comes to my mind is this. Science communication is a difficult job. And inclusive science communication is a more difficult job. So we must do the first science communication, and then we should do the inclusive science communication. That's one aspect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, our next speaker is uh, from all the way from University of Twente. Please excuse me for all the wrong pronunciations if, if I am pronouncing it wrongly. So we have uh, Dr. Anne Dijikstra who is PhD and who is currently with the uh, University of Twente as assistant professor in science communication. And she's a faculty of behavioral management sciences. She's an elected member of the PCST scientific community committee. She studies the changing relationship between science, technology, and society from a communication perspective. Her research areas focuses on understanding the, the science-society relationship so basically, she adds a sociological perspective to uh, scientific uh, researches. Uh, the keywords in her research mainly focus on public engagement, science communication, science journalism, risk communication, emerging technologies, and responsible research and innovation. So yes, over to you, Anne. What, what are your first thoughts about this theme? Um, thank you very much for your very good introduction. I think you also pronounced my name almost correctly so that's that's good it's dijkstra but yeah so remember the dikes we we have to to have in the netherlands um so um yeah my first thoughts i was thinking about it for a while now when you invited me and i think there is still yeah a long way to go especially in the netherlands also but it is a team that gets a lot of attention at this moment uh, and we can see that in, for example, the next PCST conference, which we will be organizing in the Netherlands, and where we have a specific, um, in the local organizing committee, we have a specific committee looking at um, uh, um, gender uh, inclusive, uh, inclu uh, equality, equity, uh, diversity, and inclusivity. So it is a team and it's upcoming. And I think it's, uh, we also uh, will try to um, yeah, improve it in the PCST uh, network and on the website as well. So that's a little bit for now, what I would like to share. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Uh, over to you, uh, Dr. Parul, a brief introduction about her. So Dr. Parul Sheth is Mumbai-based author, science journalist, and science writer. She's a science communicator associated with National Center for Science Communicators. Uh, she's a prolific science writer and an avid science communicator. She has completed her postdoctoral work in andrology at the Sapienza University of Rome, Italy. So I'm glad, Dr. Parul, you have agreed to be part of this uh, distinguished panel. Uh, what are your first thoughts about the theme? Thank you so much, Daivata. Uh, Actually, greetings to everybody. And thank you so much for a lovely introduction, a short and sweet. And uh, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting here today at the webinar, which has a very important topic to discuss. And it is all about gender inclusive science communication. And for that, I mean is that science is for all. It cannot be for just men or just women. Or, so what my thought is that I believe that this is the future of science communication. And this is because gender inclusive participation in science allows both men and women to 
fully benefit from the advancements in science and technology. Now, we have had a lot of trauma last past two years about COVID-19 and climate change and a lot of things occurring. So science communication was mainly focusing on that. Now, now again, it is inconceivable to say that gender uh, uh, disparity has uh, become a hindrance. But I think it has now, and it has taken the first and foremost place, and it has given more challenges. So we hope that gender parity, gender equality uh, have to be there, uh, not only among science communicators, but also among scientists. And when we get to see that the language used when we talk about scientists, it's only about he. Rarely we get to hear she and even when we manage organized conferences when we list people there uh, is a list of eminent speakers who are mostly men and that's what comes to people's minds and then just to add uh, balance that equation of gender we try to fit in uh, women scientists or women communicators so all this needs to uh, change and I'm sure it will and it's not that there are many women who have been inspiration to us like with the mass orbiter or with the Agni missile or the rocket woman so we have so many women who inspire us and the younger lot to be in it and uh, this is what I think we should discuss especially about gender diversity and inclusion so let us hear what happens now. Hey, Dr. Parul. Uh, I'm told by Surya that uh, a lot of participants are media students. So let's start with a media question so that we can uh, get their attention. Uh, what do you think, all three of you, uh, is the media gender biased towards science communication? Do you feel that media is gender biased? Or maybe we can start with Dr. Jairaman. Uh, well, my observation is there is a distinct uh, bias, which we call the Matilda effect that's familiar to the media students. If I take two science communicators, well-known science communicators male, and two female science communicators, and if I do an analysis, I find that the media's approach to these two people have been skewed. So this effect is quite transparent, quite obvious, and the reasons for that are sociological, and that needs to be found out. But the moment, and then there is always an emphasis on the personal aspects, the difficulties, the time spent elsewhere. Professionally look at two sides of an equation. Don't look at it as X, X is equal to X, Y equation. It is an A is equal to B equation. But the moment the personalities are involved, I have two case studies. The first science communicator of my home state, Janagi Amal, and the second one, Anna. These two people, were compared with the two other males, let's say Professor Yashpal and uh, Dr. Bargo. So we, this has been studied based on uh, metal dye effect. And I want to emphasize that the media has always been gravitating to this aspect. All through this, you can find. But I want to tell a counter story. The metal dye effect has been neutralized by a eureka effect by the by my organization, which is in the regional, I'll come to that a little later. Okay, yeah, Dr. Parul. Okay, gender bias, of course, is not new. It is prevalent in all sectors and it is, uh, media is no exception to it. So, uh, but uh, women science communicators are sci and scientists also, I would say women scientists are frequently misrepresented. Uh, in the media. Now, let us say, when I was going through some records, they say women only make up 24% of the persons heard, read about, or seen in newspaper, television, and radio news. So now even worse is 46% of news stories reinforce gender stereotypes while only 4% of stories clearly challenge 
gender stereotypes. So in general, only one in five experts, women experts, are interviewed by media. So it's obviously it shows that there is some <coughs> problem somewhere. Dr. Anne, what do you think? Thank you very much for this good question. Um, yeah, maybe I should share something. I want to share something about the, the numbers in the Netherlands as well. So this year we had the news that, that for the first time we had uh, the same number of PhD students um, in the whole of the Netherlands uh, uh, being female or male. So that is the first time. And uh, the number of professors at the university, of female professors in the universities in the Netherlands is only 25%. Um, well, uh, in the Netherlands, so that's only one in four. And also at our university, because I'm in a polytechnic university, uh, having uh, engineering uh, um, courses, uh, programs, as well as uh, social sciences uh, programs. Uh, in our university, we only have at this moment 34% of the PhD students are female and 20% uh, of the, the professors are female. So that's a long way to go and it increased a lot uh, since uh, 2000, but there's still a long way to go. And I think that also shows in how uh, scientists are represented in media or in other places. So I think... Um, there are, it is important to take efforts there because what we all know is, for example, that if you have a better representation, it's also a better representation of what is happening uh, actually in, uh, in, in the world around us. So, uh, yeah, in my view, I think, um, yeah, there, there is a way to go, even in the Netherlands. I think the Netherlands is not doing uh, well at the moment, and it's really uh, important to to develop a more um, diversity and equality um, in different ways. Thank you. So when we are talking about media coverage uh, of uh, you know, being gender inclusive, do you think that the field itself is gender inclusive? Is scientific uh, community and the science communication, both are different is what I argue. Do you think that they are gender inclusive? Um, anybody, whoever wants to start. I think, I think in media, there is gender inclusive. That's my opinion, because I have been with uh, media. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, the, the ratio between the men and women, I think women are more. But later on, maybe somehow something happens, something goes wrong, and then they sort of are less interested or they get into something else. That's a different story. That's but then do you think that science communication, the other side of it? We are talking about media here. Science communication, when I say... Uh, you're you're media. Media. Yes, it's different. Yes, and you were saying something. Yeah, so I think I... I know the field in the Netherlands uh, in science communication, and it's not uh, a big uh, field. Science communication is only part of media studies or communication sciences, uh, so a small part of it. So what I think, um, but I don't have the figures of that, but I think that aligns with what is with normal uh, students in the Netherlands, uh, the normal studies. So I think there is a, about equal uh, uh, balance of students uh, um, in science communication in the Netherlands. But if you go up in the positions, so it's the same as with uh, the, uh, the positions of professors in the PhD students and then uh, uh, professors in the Netherlands, I think uh, the percentages uh, are more in favor of male uh, persons. So I think there is a way to go there. Uh, yeah. So science communication can be more inclusive. And it's also what I see around me. So the people who have uh, different positions, my colleagues at other universities, there are more male than female uh, persons there. What do you think, Jeremy? Well, uh, I want to draw your attention to one fact. 
a great sociological experiment conducted on science communication and the role of women in a small state of India. Before that, let me say that uh, Professor Anne Dijkstra is not a stranger to this university. I had run a course on science communication and I have been extensively using her 276 page book called uh, Science Communication and Interaction. 276 pages had been widely used when the course was run in this university about a year ago. That is one aspect. If you look at the PCST elected members composition, you have 29 members in the PCST network, out of which 18 are female. That is 62% is the, is the invaluable figure we have with respect to female presence in the global network. Begin with that. Now I go back to a very small geography called Kerala in India, where I worked for 55 years in science communication. I started a science writer. I became a science speaker. Then I became a science communicator, the science comma, I'll call it. See, there is a big difference. India has got a science and technology and innovation policy in which science communication has been defined. It has been defined as there are four functions to be done with that. You have to inform, you have to educate, and you have to sensitize. These are the three factors. But in 1970, when I took my first course in science communication in Japan, Osaka, they told me, your business is not to inform, but to inform it. Joho Shaki. The word inform has been translated by the Japanese into inform it, and inform it is the basic business as recognized by SDI today. Now, in the model which I am referring to you, we have 15,000 women science activists in an association which has a strength of 60,000 science activists. That's the experiment which we conducted, and yesterday was the 59th anniversary of that event. So I was uh, mentally present with our females over there, and 15,000 of them had done a great job. How was this done? The world doesn't know. Even India doesn't know. For example, I work for the National Center for Science Communications where the medium English. The English has a limited reach. The finest science communication work in India has been done in the regional language. And arguably the largest science experiment, the largest science sociological intersectional experience was done in the Kerala Science Writers Association with 60,000 science activists and 59 years of its existence. Now, there in 1985, we formed a women's week, 1985. And the first thing we did was every district should send a group of women to the center of the state. We have 14 states, 14 science, art, procession state. And if I look at the composition of this, it, it has 12 members, 10 women and two man servants to attend to their work. That is what we did in 19. 85. We never looked back. Since then, we did it for two years. We took it, expanded into, augmented into a national scale, and it became an Indian event. So this science art procession was a very great event. I told you a short while ago about the Matilda effect. To counteract that, we started what is known as the Eureka effect. We started a magazine for children to catch them at the front end of the supply chain. We, when girls come to, we have the largest number of female teachers in India in our primary schools. And the, these female teachers, if you teach the girls students a bit of STEM and inspire, and uh, this is an intensely inspired inevitability which they should be able to do. But the female teachers who, uh, who outnumber men in the early childhood education have been able to sell the concept of science, STMM, to them. And that has helped enormously. One magazine which we ran in the regional language, which had 500,000 printed copies with a readership multiplied by 10. And this was exclusively meant for children between the age of 9 to 14. And girls were asked to write questions to this magazine. And every girl question was attended to by an engineer or a scientist or a doctor. We gave a reply to them. And we followed them the relationship management. And today, I find that Eureka generation of science communicators as engineers, professors, principals in the academia. And today, we have a sufficient strength. An inventory of writers has been very well built up thanks to this in the regional language. So what I'm trying to say is the Eureka effect is a model which now exists for the world to see. And we have largely succeeded in this. But we are only 25% of the total scientific activity community. The next 25, we find it extremely difficult. We have gathered the low-hanging fruits and we have brought it 
uh, the female presents to 25 percent. The next 25 is not as easy as the 25 because there are extra scientific problems. And that is what is currently annoying and bothering us. I stop here and proceed further. Thank you, Dr. Jayalaman. I mean, really wonderful initiatives, I must say. We need more such institutions to come forward and you know, practice these things. Uh, my uh, next question is to uh, Dr. Parul and Dr. Ann. Since both of you are science communicators, uh, do you think that being a women science communicator, you add a different dimension to the whole area of science communication as compared to men or it doesn't matter? So, shall I, may I answer? Anne? Sure, sure. Oh. Yeah, maybe. Uh -huh. Okay, so uh, see, communicating science is no trivial task. And, but I feel women can play a crucial role in here. And uh, women surely have an advantage over their male counterparts in the channel of communication per se. Like, I would like to just uh, give an example that uh, women are naturally tuned to communicate. So they, in, especially in speech and actions. Uh, just for your information, they use almost 10,000 to 20,000 words in a day, as compared to men who use just 5,000 to 10,000 words in a day. So you can imagine how, what is the capacity of a woman. Also, they are better teachers. So they have an empathy to listen. That is one of the best, best and uh, I think a uh, very good quality, uh, which, is, which can make you, a, make you superior to men. If you have to communicate science, then it is, again, that could be used as an advantage. And good communication needs a basic understanding of the subject. So science communication actually deals with the science, makes it accessible, excitable and part of everyday life. So women surely have an edge because they're better teachers and that opens up a vista for them. So like you are in a different dimension as such. When you have all these qualities, uh, you can be definitely, uh, you can go ahead and be not, I wouldn't say superior to men, but uh, you, you can excel in your profession, whichever way. And uh, we will uh, see like, Today, leading role women play, uh, especially in strategic research in fields of every field, I would say biotechnology, astronomy, or um, like any technology, information technology for that matter. Only thing is women could be great science communicators. They have this great quality which needs to be harnessed. What do you think? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barrett. What do you think, Anne? Um, can you can you repeat the question again? What exactly was the question? Yeah, I, my question is: Being a woman, do you think that you add a different dimension to the science communication field as compared to men, or gender doesn't matter? I think I do um, in a way. Um, so I was thinking about how then. Um, and maybe I can give an example because I'm uh, also coordinating a, an honors program for research students who want to become researchers at our university. So we select every year uh, 15 students or 20 students maximum. Um, and what we try to teach them in those courses is like broader skills, what you need in academia. But specifically, we also uh, look at what position um, researchers have towards society and with society. And what I see now more recently in the recent years is that there is more attention to, to gender, finally, to inclusivity. It's also something that the students themselves bring in as topics. Um, and I think it's good to start at the younger, well, the younger positions or the younger age to make people aware of how, um, academia works and what you can do there. And I also see differences between the, because we, what we do also in the selection of the students, we try to, to make it a balanced selection. So we have, uh, this year we even have uh, more female students than male students because we, are, we had fewer uh, male students who were uh, qualified. Um, 
but we we um yeah uh, we 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 see that female students do do are different in how they approach the program for example how serious they are about the program and how they um bring it in and 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 they have yeah more attention for it now so uh, we do something on women in science at this moment which we didn't a few years ago so i think what we can do is um yeah uh, exchange experiences there but also make people more aware at the younger age so that will help uh at the later age when they are in higher positions uh, um, uh to maybe uh, uh make changes there absolutely absolutely what do you think uh, jeram and sir uh, gender matters when it comes to science communication yes it does matter and i entirely agree with uh, parul's observation we have been seeing this and i was looking at the legacy left behind by the indian women scientists association 2000 scientists women scientists of india they have gathered and there is a united front and they have been communicating science but the style and the fashion and the pattern in which they have communicated is quite different from how we do it there is a high fidelity communication because all of them are scientist communicators trust is an essential fact in science communication if i speak about biotechnology where i am innocent i will not be taken for any value but if i speak on nuclear science or reactor technology i'll be valued for that so if you speak on topics of general or generic interest whereas these 2000 women scientists are 30 to 40 years of experience in the laboratory so in the academics we teach a subject and in the academics we also do a research but working in a research laboratory as a professional career scientist and then turning out and 2000 of them and is an organized scientific activity of the highest magnitude that is available in the country and if you study their fact the the profile of these scientists and the institute organized science communication has come of age in this country and there are 50 year old organizations doing it there are 20 year organizations 20 year old organizations doing it so the organizational behavior of scientists communicators and science communicators enough a wealth of data wealth of data is available in this country which is yet to be done investigated by science communication researchers uh i i see that of late there are some conscious efforts by uh, the scientific community to you know be gender inclusive mm -hmm. so by these conscious efforts what opportunities you feel that have opened for women whoever maybe jeram yes, yes. <laughs> sir so, it is a very interesting question and it shows a brighter future in store for us uh, the recent enactment of this scientific social responsibility by the god along with uh, corporate social responsibility now the mandate is for every scientist to have their scientific social responsibility if every woman scientist come comes out and explain the work which we are they are doing in the laboratory its implications and the sociological benefit that is going to come it becomes necessary for them as a result of their funding they have to give four lectures there is a detailed guideline given for every scientist and if every woman scientist follows this i think uh, mao's dream that half the sky belongs to them or castro's philosophy the revolution within revolution can be very easily had at the moment i do agree it is 15% 25% of the sharing of the scientific psychon space sky space it will definitely be much higher if scientific social responsibility is internalized by the women scientists all over the globe absolutely thank you uh, what do you think dr ann um yeah i think it's um yeah with some conscious efforts by science communicate community to to be gender inclusive do you think that it has opened opportunities for women yeah i think well in the netherlands you see changes from 2000 when they started with more efforts i think the netherlands especially um well is or was at least a a a, a country which wasn't doing well Uh, you wouldn't expect that uh, so much but i think it wasn't doing well regarding inclusivity and gender 
I think now with some efforts, it is increasing, but there's still a lot a way to go. And for example, we have now at the university uh, a female um, faculty network. So that is a way of uh, how you can, um, as female uh, professors, uh, exchange experiences, uh, um, empower each other, um, make uh, uh, more efforts in uh, uh, measures being taken at the at the national level, and I think that also is happening at the at the national level uh, at the uh, in the Netherlands. So there are uh, programs in which female professors can apply. Um, specifically, and those are good, but we're not there yet. There's still a long way to go. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think it is good that there is more attention. And it's also what uh, 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 Professor AP mentioned in the PCST network, actually, we have a system of um, uh, the countries uh, or the, the, the continents being represented. And actually, I think it's good that we have uh, more female uh, in the board in the committee than men. Um, but there also, I think in practice, there is still a, a long way to go. Uh, even, yeah, even there uh, probably. Thank you. Dr. Parul. Yeah, I, I agree that gender inclusivity has definitely opened up uh, newer opportunities. And uh, if we see uh, recently, we have uh, definitely higher inclusion of women, women empowerment is there. And uh, re uh, the numbers are improving uh, and uh, women are coming forward, uh, especially uh, now they are, even uh, the younger women, I would say with education and all those younger women who are not encouraged into the STEM studies. Now they have all uh, come up with uh, like they, are into great progress yeah. and uh, promoting inclusive and respectful communication definitely can contribute to the progress of science. Thank you. Um, you know, whenever we talk about gender inclusivity, we always talk about men and women, but you know, gender inclusivity is much more larger than that. So, uh, and I, I think we are just being a little more ambitious when we talk about including LGBTQ communities, more specifically transgenders in science communication. Uh, do, you, do you think that we, we have gender inclusive policies from the real census? Maybe Dr. Jairaman or, yeah, maybe Dr. Barul, yes, go ahead. Uh, let us listen to the international situation on uh, transgenders and because you know that's, that's more discussed in the academia globally, yes. Professor Anne would like to comment on this. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking of, yeah. So I think EDI is more indeed than only uh, gender. Um, so maybe an example is the program that I'm coordinating on, on the, the honors program, the research honors program. So what is interesting there is that uh, we select students based on, well, gender, but also on the different programs from the university and they're in, so the different study programs they're in, but also the different countries they come from. So, um, which is interesting because often in the program, we only have like a, a few Dutch people and then people from India, from Africa, from um, different other countries in Europe. And one of the outcomes, which is always interesting, which is not one of the learning goals, specifically because you cannot put it in as a learning goal is always that they say at the end that they learn from each other as a group um, from their different backgrounds from their different cultures and I think that is interesting because um, yeah if you compare I think in academia specifically um, it is a situation other even than uh, in my daily uh, around uh, surrounding here that you will meet people from different backgrounds and it's important to, to know and that you have to collaborate but often with, in my case at least as science communication researcher and, and teacher uh, with people from different backgrounds from dif with different uh, uh, also from engineering from social sciences from philosophy uh, but also from different countries of the world um, I think there that is important <clears throat> to learn at a younger age 
and to become aware that uh, there are more possibilities or more perspectives on a topic. And maybe then uh, skills like being able to listen uh, come in there, I think. Thank you. Dr. Parul. Uh, talking about the LGBTQ community, I think they are a part of society. Uh, in India, uh, unlike global situation, in India the situation is a little different. But I think uh, people have started uh, approving and uh, including them as well. Uh, like the other day I read uh, just two days back in Times of India, there was about something about gender inclusion. And there's a school in Mumbai where they have a special, spe specific, uh, they have formed a rainbow club and that is specifically for the LGBTQ community. And uh, the student council is uh, behind it and teachers mm -hmm. are helping them. So I think we are including them also slowly, but it is still in a primitive stage, I would say. I agree. Yes, uh, Dr. Jairaman. Well, uh, we have uh, an overview, a bird's eye view or a helicopter view of the situation of science communication. But uh, I'm now convinced that uh, the enormous amount of information locally locked up has not been available to the global community. And there has been a reinventing of the wheel in many places. There is esoteric research going on at the top and there is grassroots work going on at the intersectional level with the people science movements. So popular science associations, people science movements, they belong to two categories theoretically. And at the moment, where the work is required, when we crafted our manifesto, science for social revolution, not science for science's sake, just like art for art's sake. What is the ultimate objective of science? My quality of life is not improved. And my quality of life means not the light literate one, but the one who has been underprivileged. So it is, a, it is the duty of the scientific community, the scientific social responsibility of attending to the problems. And those problems, as Professor Han suggested the word engineer, we started first working with engineers. We asked the house women and the kitchen. They said, we are suffering from lacry lacrimatory effect of the fuel which we are using. Wet sticks are being used in the kitchen for creating fire. So we designed the first domestic oven and we replaced the local lacrimatory ones. That was the first entry into the heart of women. Thereafter, next time when we visited, they asked us more questions. So we must solve their identity, recognize, evaluate, and control their problems. As long as, and, re, and recognition of problems is a very different, different thing. We are so accustomed and assimilated into the internal, uh, present situation, the problem of what is happening in the kitchen and what should be happening. And an engineering mind should be able to design and deliver and deploy that and show the demonstrations. So scientific communication, science communication, practical terms, beginning with, Deployment of engineering in an applicable manner to a given situation where the problem is solved. I think that is the vitality of science communication because the word engineering is embedded in science. Mm -hmm. Read more to that. Thank you. Uh, my next question is that, I mean, we, we are talking about institutional practices for being gender inclusive. But uh, do you think that individual contributors also have to work towards, you know, uh, gender inclusive, what efforts women scientists have to take, according to you, to be more visible in the field? Maybe Dr. Parul. I think um, if <clears throat> we have to be, we have to have gender inclusive society in our country, uh, which is uh, definitely the uh, it's the thing is moving on, but there's definitely a disparity between the male and female ratio. But let me uh, give you one example. Uh, we had a story in current science where we had, uh, they had listed between 2010 to 2020 uh, women writers. And they found that uh, women writers were much less than the male writers. Yeah. So, uh, 
gender inclusion and and another thing which we noticed was that uh, women writers were always collaborating with the men writers so why would they want to collaborate they can individually bring out some publication for them anyway so these are the notion you know that prevails in minds of people that women cannot take up physics and they cannot manage maths and stuff like that because uh, they had, don't have the aptitude for that but that may not be true that is not true and uh, it's not that the main men have the natural aptitude towards uh, uh, all these stem subjects mm -hmm. so uh, they, they are very difficult to grasp for something no uh, so i'm sure gender inclusive uh, inclusivity is getting on in our country diversity and inclusivity so both things are there I hope I think I've deviated from your question a bit, but <laughs> please excuse me. No, no worries. You're very much on point. Uh, yeah, Dr. Anne, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I think it's important that uh, women um, also, um, well, maybe it's also known that sometimes women are more uh, reluctant to present themselves. I think it's good that women um, become more aware that they do that and that they step out and um, incre try to increase their presence in science communication. But it's also kind of dilemma because if there are fewer female available, it's more effort. So it's more a burden for the individual women. So I think it's good if, if you yeah, collaborate in networks, if you look at examples, uh, become more aware, strengthen each other, um, train people in doing that. So I think, yeah, being a teacher at the university, I think training is a good way and developing courses, uh, including those topics, discussing um, ways of doing it, it will help because you will start, yeah, what I said, you start at a younger age and then uh, it will have will have effect later on. And that is really, really useful, probably. Absolutely. Uh, that, can I make a contrary narrative? Absolutely. Uh, I, as a fossilized science writer, find it very difficult to write an article in my regional language and get it published against the best writings by the women writers. It is impossible for a male to be a good science communicator in my yeah. language. And I myself would withdraw my submission as soon as I see three or four written by the female writers who were students of Eureka of my class. So we have a generation of female writers, but they write in a language which is not English. That is the only. So, the, so I am in the minority. There is an exclusion principle <laughs> against me on this. What do you think? Who is responsible for uh, being gender inclusive and include gender diversity? Whom should we have responsible that this is what you are supposed to do? Institutions, individuals, societies? Comes from the top. It comes from the top and it goes down, I think. So everybody. Everybody is responsible. Maybe, what do you think? In particular, maybe we say human resources department, but uh, I would say this is the BI comes. I think it's comes. it's both. So there should be um, um, policies and developed uh, policies and being implemented. But on the other hand, if women do not um, um, tell what they think is important of what will help. Then um, yeah, it's still then it's still something top down. It it also has to come bottom up. So it, I think it's a little bit both. What do you think, Jairaman sir? Yes, uh, I feel uh, there is a traditional fear that there is a glass ceiling. Women also see that there is a glass ceiling which they are not able to cross. Now, assuming without admitting that there is a glass ceiling. It is necessary that this year, the International Year of Glasses, the glass should be broken. If it is a normal sodium silicate glass, you have no problem, any woman can do that. If it is borosilicate glass, institutionalized, 
then we need a little more strength. But if it is lead insulated glass prepared specifically to prevent women from going up, that needs an engineering skill to demolish that glass. So glass ceiling should be broken. Let us not assume that a model which has been in the textbook has been, we are so obsessed with certain ideas. I personally do not find any ceiling anywhere. It's only what we put in that we are able to put. I think Dr. Jairaman raised a very valid point of glass ceiling. I know I was trying to avoid it because every time we talk about gender inclusivity, we talk about glass ceiling. But I think it is equally valid uh, in a concept. As women science communicators, uh, Dr. Parul and Dr. Ann, do you feel that you uh, you were facing glass ceiling at some point of time of your career? Yeah, shall I start? I yes. think I, I I have noticed that a few times. Um, and also in my jobs, very practically, that um, uh, I found out that for the same position, I was paid less than my female uh, colleague, for example, my first position as a science communicator, but also now with making steps in academia. And... Yeah, that's again why it is important. Uh, I think becoming a member of the PCST and being elected as a member to the scientific committee, uh, such things also help uh, to uh, become more visible of what you're doing, uh, that it is important. So yeah, I think, th yeah, their steps can be taken, can be made. What do you think, Dr. Parul? Have you faced glass ceiling? Uh, they, um, it's, there is an invisible glass ceiling, of course, uh, which we don't like to mention it. But I think uh, every workplace, uh, it's, it's there. Now, uh, what I feel is, but there are instances uh, in where, where women uh, do suffer more because uh, when they are pulled down, and uh, uh, even in spite of doing as much work as men are doing and they are good at it and yet the work is not appreciated mm -hmm. and that's where they lose their confidence in the next uh, wherever they are working so and even about the pay what Anne mentioned you know too like because he's a family man so he is the breadwinner in the family and he needs to be paid more I mean, uh, so you they get a better raise and they get a frequent raise. But for women, it is not like that. No. So it is time for us to uh, institutions and people to recognize the strength and styles and capabilities of talented women. Yeah. Thank you. We are almost uh, uh, no, over the time. One last question and then we'll conclude. Uh, what suggestions would you give to uh, science communicators to make science communication more gender inclusive. You have been talking about it, but maybe one or two suggestions which have not been implemented. Maybe we start with Dr. Jairaman because he's working a lot in this field. I suggest that at primary schools, secondary high schools, girls should be given the advantages of a STEM education and the future will be, they should be future ready. And most of the jobs of the future will be STEM. So if they are taught that the importance of STEM in their career, that will be one good idea. And they should also be taught how to speak and write so that they become communi competent communicators in the school level itself, at the front end of the supply chain. If you do not take care of in the primary schools, at the graduate level, in the postgraduate level, you will be putting an enormous effort, but with the counterproductive results. I feel schools and female teachers in the schools have the social responsibility to launch this at the very front end of the supply chain of science communication. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. From my perspective, uh, being a teacher at the university as well, I would say that more attention for it in the engineering programs or in the in all teaching uh, bachelor's and master's degrees would be interesting and in both in science communication and how you can present science or how you can discuss science on how you can meet the, the needs of society, but also in people as students, making them aware of what is happening and how they can make changes. That is really good. That, that will really help. Uh, and then of course, as, as individual, uh, from my perspective, uh, I can maybe 
strive for more equality for my personally, but I can also help others uh, to to become more visible or uh, to um, uh, um, make steps, for example. And and that is something I think. Um, instead of, of thinking that it doesn't work, uh, I still can help younger people and other people to um, uh, make better progress. Dr. Parvin. Uh, women need to be more vocal, more assertive, and more focused uh, to get what they want. Now, with gender inclusion, science communication can reach a greater level because diversity of thought leads to better results. Now, without inclusion, there will be no diversity. So inclusion should be a strategic priority. We need to remove the blinkers and appreciate and leverage a gender inclusive science communication for the progress of scientific awareness. So it is important to remove barriers to equality, celebrate diversity, and promote inclusion to encourage a positive culture. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I said last question, but there's one uh, from audiences. Uh, we'll just take that one. Uh, she says that STEM women who publicly speak about their work are often stereotyped as bossy, even by their own gender. Even women working within science hold an implicit stereotype or personal bias. This puts women in a more vulnerable position while communicating. We are talking about institutional and cultural changes, but how does one combat with the personal bias? Yeah. This is a very difficult question because uh, personal bias is going to be there in every field of work. And uh, that will definitely influence a person's personality. Uh, but they have to be more vocal. They have yeah. to assert themselves. Again, I would say that. I agree there. But also, if, if, if like the PCST network, if and what we have at the university, a female faculty network, I think that helps because you can exchange experiences, but also learn from each other and maybe uh, um, learn that there, there are also other ways of communicating or other ways of getting your goals, but not being shy and... Um, no leaving it. I think, yeah, we have to, to keep on working on it. Thank you. What do you think, Dr. Jiraman? How, how does one combat personal bias? Yes, this is a real problem because once you come to the public stage, you become a visible scientist or a science communicator. And there is a luminosity associated with visibility. And science and science communication is a fiercely competitive field. And you are always being viewed, weighed in the grudging scales of visibility. Therefore, it is natural for your colleagues to look at you with envy. Therefore, and there will be also backbiting on that. If you cannot tide over those traits, it is very difficult to survive. But if you yield to that, the society is to lose. That is all what I would say. There will be a few sacrificial gods in the beginning, but role models are emerging. And today, I, in, in specific geographies, I do not find this problem. Absolutely. I mean, it's not only about science uh, where you see these personal biases. I think it's uh, there in almost all fields. I mean, I see, I feel it in media profession also. So oh, no. it's all about how you respond to this personal bias rather than whether you should, uh, you know, find a solution for that. So I think I, 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 I personally ignore it. That's the best solution. <laughs> Okay, uh, with this, we'll come to the closure of this uh, panel discussion. I can thank all my distinguished panelists, Dr. Parul, Dr. Jairaman, and Dr. Anne. You made it so wonderful. Uh, it was, I enjoyed interacting with all of you. And very valid points raised by uh, you. What I uh, What is a takeaway for me is what Dr. Parul said, that we need to have women writing as independent authors and not you know, co-authoring with uh, with the men, that is very important that, you know, academicians and researchers come ahead and take the responsibility individually rather than, you know, collaborating with someone else. So that's a very interesting takeaway for me. Uh, Dr. Jai Raman mentioned uh, about his contributions through NSCPC and uh, Kerala Science Communicators. I, I, 
I think he's, he's worked extensively in this field and that reflects on his, uh, in his talk that when he was talking with authority and with examples, certainly a, a lot of uh, insights which I can take back. Uh, Dr. Anne, I, it was wonderful listening to you because especially when, when I'm getting a perspective from a, from a different culture, from a different country, and you know, then I was introspecting uh, the conditions here in my country. So it was, uh, it was delightful to listen to your views uh, on the field. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, I would just conclude with one last anecdote. Uh, when I was invited for one of the panel, uh, as, and I was to talk on gender inclusivity in science communication, the, uh, the organizer said that uh, we don't have a women speaker, so we would want you to be there because, you know, the decorum will be complete. So, to which I said, I'm not a flower pot, you know, to make your decorum complete. And of course, I refused that. Uh, speaking opportunity, but then that's what it is. So we, as women, need to be more, uh, we need to take more efforts towards gender science communication and men community has to be more uh, open for us to include in, in the larger interest of the society. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to hand over the session to Aishna for concluding this comedy. Thank you, uh, Devita, ma'am. And, uh, you know, being a sociologist and especially a feminist academician, we often talk about how the scientific community is both uh, mainstream and mainstream. And uh, the idea of it being gender inclusive, therefore, is a way forward in itself. Um, with that, uh, on behalf of HNSC University, I would like to extend my warm gratitude to all our panelists and our moderator for today. Uh, to start with, uh, 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 I, I would like to thank Dr. Himrata Bagla, Vice Chancellor at HSNC University, uh, for actively organizing such webinars and giving us a platform to discuss and deliberate upon these issues. I would like to thank uh, the, uh, you know, our Vice Principal of KC College, uh, Mr. Samajit Padhi, for taking out time from his very busy schedule and welcoming everyone here. Um, I would like to thank Dr. Uh, Lina Pujari, who is... Uh, you know, uh, the head of the gender issues cell of Casey College for always uh, actively uh, taking gender issues forward in our college and maintaining that culture. Uh, thank you to Dr. Devita Patil uh, for moderating this session today and uh, for engaging with everyone and taking the session ahead. Uh, and I would like to thank our panelists for today. Uh, Dr. APJ Raman, sir, Dr. Parul Shet, and Dr. Anne Dijkstra for your ideas, thoughts, and inputs. Uh, thank you, Surya, for being a wonderful co-host, and uh, my dear students and part participants for being present in this webinar today. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> thank you, Aishna. Uh, sir, uh, Padhi, sir, with your permission, Daivata Ma'am, Jai Raman, sir, can we announce that we are ending the session? Yes. Yes, Surya, please. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you. much, everyone, Thank for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Tech team, we can end the session. Thank you. Uh, always, can you stop the recording and end the session, please?